All right, so you are in SWIN 1001 or COMP 1161, but in general, it's object oriented programming. Uh, there are some basic aims um, of the course, but I'll jump quickly to the rationale because hardly today there are any um, real enterprise wide applications that exist that um, doesn't utilize some aspect of object oriented. Um, programming. And so there's someone who is going to be involved in software development, application um, development, or whatever it is uh, in this area, it is useful. And so it is considered a requirement for um, degrees in information technology. So um, this is not moving. So, um, this course is actually um, spread over the entire semester, um, and we will have one two-hour lecture each week um, for 12 weeks, and please take the lecture as a means of introducing you um, to the materials to be covered for the week, right? Um, because we don't have enough time to go through all the materials that you're required to cover based on the course outline which you will read online. All right? So then, what we suggest is that when you come to lecture, you're looking out for that which is necessary for the completion of the content for the week. Not necessarily all the things will be um, presented and covered in lecture. And that's why we also have a tutorial and a lab session in which we um, require you to do some activities which are going to be graded, All right? Now, you will find also some required supplemental material, right, um, online that you're expected to go through. These include videos as well as, um, you know, other types of materials, documents for you to read and so on. All right, tutorial sessions, you are expected to prepare and be ready to solve the problems in the tutorial session. We will publish that online um, prior to the session and you're expected to prepare because if you don't come to the tutorial prepared, then it's not going to be as useful um, for you because we want to know that you're trying to solve the problems that are given and then you actually come with the questions so that we can clarify any issues you're having. So we endeavor to publish um, these things online ahead of time. Of course, everyone wants to know how will the course be assessed? Um, it's a 50-50 course, which means that you must, um, well, the coursework and the exam are weighted equally, and you must pass each independently. All right? Now, you will have one in course test, well, yes, you will have one in course test, you will have online quizzes, and also you will have um, a project. Now the project will be graded in four parts, all right? So it's one project, but we'll give you in four pieces, and as we progress throughout the course, you'll be asked to complete and submit those pieces independently. Now each piece will depend on the other, right? Um, but don't think, that um, if you get the first part wrong, then everything else is going to be wrong. No, what we will do is as we go along, we will give you a clean version of what um, you are supposed to continue with, regardless of what you submitted um, from, from the previous version. And of course, I mean, you are creative students today. I'm not sure how many of you use the traditional textbooks, but of course we prescribe one for you um, that we expect you to be familiar with. Um, and I'm sure you'll, you'll access that online um, from Pierce who provides uh, a paid version. Right? Right, Kevin? Yes, sir. Good. All right. Just a note on plagiarism. Um, just be aware that all work submitted should be your own. You sh may share ideas but not implementation, 
right? In this regard, please also um, be aware that we will be using automated software to assess all submissions. And those submissions that have a high similarity index will be flagged for action. Now, notice to be taken that if you share your work or if you are the recipient of shared work, both of you are equally culpable, right? And so I, I hope it suggests to you that either way, you are going to be penalized, right? So you are to guard your work so that nobody can access it and you are not to share it, except if you are assisting somebody, you can share your ideas, not your final work, because once they're too similar, then we are going to consider it as cheating, right? Any questions? Kevin? I'm not hearing it so well. Is there a question, yes or no? No. You're happy, right? Yeah. Good. All right, so now we're going to start off in the main with what we're supposed to be covering um, today. It's going to be done in two parts, and we'll take a break at the end of the first part, which is Lecture 1A. And um, we will hopefully transition to Lecture 1B in the second hour. All right? Um, you will know that the lecture slides uh, will have um, much notes because we, we are trying to at least explain the concepts. So when you take them away, you should be able to read through, all right? Um, so some of it, I will just glance over. Don't expect me to um, go into detail when it's something that is um, properly explained on the lecture slide, all right? All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the concept of an object and a class. Then we're going to move to a short history of object-oriented programming, and then we're going to touch on a few principles of OO. All right. So, um, of course, when we are writing programs, generally we are solving a problem, all right. And um, most of you would have been aware of the steps required to solve a problem, right? It's called a problem-solving um, process. Now, generally, you have to have an understanding of what the problem is. Um, and once you have an understanding of that problem, you probably want to look at possible ways of solving it. In our case, uh, the, the kinds of problems that we are focused on are those problems that can be solved by a computer. Right? Now, once you have decided that, okay, this is the way I'm going to solve it, then the next thing you start doing is to design how that solution is going to work. All right, and maybe even at the time when you design a solution, you have to go back and consider some alternatives to what you originally came up with. All right, it's always good to have one or two um, options. Once you have decided, um, then the next thing you want to do is to implement the solution. And most importantly, you can't tell whether or not the solution is a good one unless you test to make sure that it's okay. And if it's okay, then fine. If it's not okay, then you probably have to go back and do some refinement, even from the point of trying to understand the problem all over again, because maybe you've got something wrong there, right? So we emphasize that don't think that you're gonna just go through from steps one to five as we have it here, and it's going to be done. Sometimes you have to go back. And so these activities are not necessarily occurring in a linear form, all right? And sometimes you might get a particular point and you jump back to another point, right? Just to make sure that you're getting ahead. So then, the key to designing a program lies in breaking it into manageable pieces. So we are now designing the solution and implementing it. So when you're writing a software, generally, one approach is to um, break it into separate pieces Right, and then have each part put together to get the final solution. All right, now let's set that aside for a moment. When you are actually writing your code, when you're ready to implement, there are several different approaches to doing your implementation. But the two most popular or predominant approaches, right, is what we call functional oriented design where you basically break down your, your, your entire program into a series of different 
functions or what we call modules, right? And each of those will be doing one thing, right? So you know, you have a module that is going to calculate interest, for example, or you have a module that is going to allow you to manage um, customer information or, or, or update customer information. So that's one approach, right? The second approach is object-oriented design, uh, which emphasizes breaking the program into parts that represent things about the application. A different way of thinking, but a lot of people suggest that it's a more natural way of thinking, and we will, um, the jury is out on that, we will decide as we go along. So, if we have a problem um, statement, right? How do we determine what are supposed to be the objects that will form a part of our solution if we are taking the object for the approach, right? In general, there is what we call a class responsibility um, collaborators approach where you kind of write down, um, you go to a systematic process of trying to identify these by using um, the nouns that represent information and then you, you, you move from there into actually drawing your class diagrams and so on. Things that we're gonna do later on in the course, all right? But these things moving to a point where you have a solution with objects is an approach that will take some work and the more you do it, the better you become at it. Because sometimes you have a description of a problem, right? And you come up with you know, a description of the solution, right? And then you extract from that the nouns and the verbs as is generally told. But then the further you go, you realize there are some things that are implicit. And then you have to include those. And then you find out that not every um, noun are going to be, well, not every noun that you identify will actually end up being a class, right? Or an object, right? I will soon differentiate between classes and objects. Now, so here's an example though, in general. If you were to be building a, an example application to do say school registration, all right? Um, some of the things that we might identify as objects within that domain would be like the student or the course or a timetable, yes? If we were to think about a hotel reservation, Kevin, are you there? Yes. Okay, I just saw your video go. Um, room request, room, guest reservation, and so on may be examples of objects. If we're thinking about a real estate management system, what do you think be some of the natural objects that occur in that kind of a system? Okay, Bill. I'm not hearing you so well. Can you, can you hear me? No. <laughs> well, there's a suggestion here from our group. A house, right? Might be an object. Any other? The realtor? Yeah? Property owner? Yeah? Right, so those are some possibilities. But it gets a little bit more technical than that, and we'll get to that. Now, let us now try to differentiate the difference between a class and an object. In general, um, the type of an object is referred to as a class, okay? What does that really mean? A class is like a blueprint. Think about a building. Think about a housing scheme, for example, where you have houses that are built based on the same blueprint. The blueprint would be the class, but each house that is built is an object, okay? So the blueprint is what you have to have before you can create instances of that blueprint, which becomes the house. So each house would be an object, but the blueprint would be the class. Any questions? No. So a class represents the concept, and the object represents the actual embodiment of that concept. So it actually, so for example, when you think about a blueprint, right? It is just a drawing, yes? 
for a house. But then when you instantiate that drawing, it becomes a house at a particular location, which has an address, right? And certain other characteristics that would have been modeled from the blueprint, but are different for each house. So for example, every house has a different address, but it's modeled from the same blueprint, right? So if you want to find out, for example, what type of house is it? You probably can visit the blueprint to see what type of house it is because the blueprint is what classifies the house. And that's what a class really is. But in programming terms, so we will end up defining that concept. But when our program is running and data is added to it, it becomes an object. Right? So then um, we use what is called unified modeling language. Um, to specify classes or to depict them. And in general, it's just a, a, a square with three parts. The first part is where you put the name of the class and generally we write those using proper case, right? <clears throat> the second segment of that um, table, sorry, of, of the rectangle or the square um, is holds the data, right? That is the story. So if we think about it, if our class is called student, maybe a student has a name, an ID number, a date of birth, and so on and so forth. So you'd write those in the second segment here. Then in the third segment, right, um, are what we call the operations to be carried out on the objects that become part of this. So let us say a student might be able to register for a course, right? Um, you would write register for a course here as an operation that can be carried out by this class. And we'll get a lot more examples of this, right? A little bit later on. But for reference, this is the notation that we are going to be using, all right? When we say um, sketch a class, right, or specify a class, this is the notation we're going to use, UML there. All right, so you draw this um, example here and um, carry that forward. So here's an example of an account class. Notice this class is called account, right? Um, give me, based on this description, right? Give me one data object um, that this class holds. Kevin? Can you hear us? No. Hello? Can you hear us? Hello? Yes. Balance. Balance. Good. And here we know that there are three operations. Um, we can deposit, withdraw, and check balance. And I'm going to show you a little bit more on that in a moment. Now, we said a class is a blueprint for an object, right? So we know that it defines what object stores, the operations to be carried out, and um, object is an instance of a class. So you can't have an object without a class that it is of the type of it, all right? Um, so an object, however, is created by a process called instantiation. Right? So when we instantiate a class or we create an instance of the class, right, that becomes the object. Right? So throughout this course, we're going to refer to you instantiating the class. Right? That really means creating an object of the type of that class. All right? And of course, just from my example with a housing scheme and a blueprint, you can have one blueprint or one class, but many instances of it, as in many houses that are built according to that blueprint. All right, so keep that example in mind. So here's an example of two instances of the account class. All right, now we're going to be using Java in this course, and Java is covered in the, in the second part of, of the lecture. All right, we're going to be using Java. And in Java, generally, we create an instance of a class by using the new operator, the NAW as you see there. So here we create two instances, one called ACC1 and the other called ACC2. All right. Now notice 
they will carry the same blueprint, but the data that is in each of the instances will be different. Everybody sees that? So one has a balance of 100, the other 200. Good. All right? Now, we can then invoke a method that is associated with a object. All right? Generally, if we have a class, sorry, if we have an object that is to speak to another object, we do that by invoking um, methods which are the same as operations. All right? Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little while, but just for reference, remember that the account class has check balance, deposit, and withdraw. Right? Notice from here, we have deposit, withdraw, and get balance. That typo there, it should be um, get, not check balance. Right? Now, in, 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 in regular terms, we can say check balance is used to ask how much money there is in the account. Deposit is used to update the amount or to add an amount. A withdraw is used to take away an amount from the balance, all right? Now, how would those really, really work, all right? If we were to say account one deposit, I will pass in $50, then we expect that the balance is supposed to be updated in account one, but that has nothing to do with account two because it's a different instance, all right? Now, notice between account one and deposit we use a a dot or what is called a period. So we are able to use the name of the instance with the dot followed by the operation, the name of the method. So that this method does something to this instance. Yes? Now every instance will have the method associated and available. But if you call the method on the instance, only that instance is going to be affected. Except in a case where we're going to be talking about static um, um, modifier, and, and that will be later on. So again, if we look at account two, if we call the withdraw with $100, right, then it should modify the balance from 200 by taking away 100. Note, of course, we didn't write the code to do this as yet, right? And we're not going to say that every method is going to operate the same way everywhere you see them because we have to now create that. But I wanted to see how this thing works first, right? And then we can start putting it together, putting it together. Everybody with me? All right. So generally, um, just note that if we call an operation on a particular instance, except in certain other cases, which I'll talk about a little later. That operation only affects that instance, right? Yes? Good. Now, the interesting part, and this makes life even, even, even nicer, is that an object can actually hold other objects. Yeah? Yes? So, if you think about it, um, maybe, let me just follow back, although there's another example here, let me just bring back my own example of the, the house in the community, right? Now, maybe we could, for example, define a, a, a class called room, and that room might have some specifications like the, this, the length and the width, right, and number of windows, right? And then, so when we are actually creating a house, right, one of the data items that is stored in the house class is going to be a room. But that is also another object, yes, which has its own data as well as its methods that are associated with it. All right? So that is something to think about, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later in the course. Um, we look at um, aggregation and composition and so on. And of course, the example that is here is talking about um, a customer, um, and you will read that in your own time. And so, um, just pulling from that, if you notice here, um, adding to our example from account, a customer could hold 
a customer name, saving account, and a checking account. What type of variable is saving and checking? If you notice, the type is listed here, and they are of type account, which means that the blueprint for this data is in the account class. Everybody see that? The blueprint for checking account is in the account. Yes? So basically, checking account will have all the things that are in the account class as defined here. Yes? Balance and these three methods. And same thing for savings account. Yes? Now, if you think about it, a customer may now have different things that they are able to do. <laughs> so for example, a customer might want to deposit salary, transfer some money from one account to the other, or pay a bill. Now, we don't know yet, because we haven't defined, which account the deposit of the salary will go into. We don't know which one yet the transferring is going to come from and going to and so on and so forth. But that comes later on when we actually write in the logic for our method. Yes? Now, in general, our classes, the methods in our classes are manipulating the data items within the class. Okay? Or providing services related to items within the class. Now, that's a dis design kind of um, discussion, which you will have around about week, week four or so. Maybe. A little earlier, and I will talk about you know, good design principles. I will talk a little bit more about that. All right, now, in UML, the actual way of representing um, the interaction between classes where one class has another class as its member, um, sorry, one object has a, another object as its member is by um, drawing a line between them with an arrow. All right? The arrow is a little bit faint here, but it's here. It's pointing to this class, all right? And we'll get into notations a little bit um, later, all right? When we do uh, more work on UML. So, um, here's an exercise that you have a minute to do. Let's sketch a code for each of the operations of the customer class. What are the operations? Deposit salary, transfer and pay bill. What would those look like? Just tell me. What deposit salary, we would need to know which of the accounts we are putting the money into. And so in general, what we are going to be doing is adding the amounts to what already exists in that account, right? Yes? What about transfer? We are going to need to know which account we're moving from and which account we're moving to, right? And then the amount is going to be added to the account we're moving to and taken away from the account we're moving from, right? And pay bill is pretty much the same because paying bill is moving from one account. It's just that usually when you're paying a bill, you're taking out of one account and putting into an account that is not yours, <laughs> right? So you will need access to an alternate account, all right? So what does that look like really? Um, for deposit salary, you could deposit that to your saving account. So you could call saving account, right? The deposit and you pass the amount in there. Looks okay. Remember, in customer we have saving account, right? What is that? It's of type account. I remember account has a deposit, withdraw, and a get balance. So we can say this object, right, dot deposit and the amount. 
So we call it the deposit from this object, which is of type account with an amount. So we realize, remember, deposit takes in an amount, but we are calling the deposit on the object of type account. Yes? Right? And we're passing in the amount. Kind of easy, right? And if we transfer, remember, we need to withdraw from one account and deposit to another account. Now, in this case, we just say saving and, and checking account. We're taking away from saving and putting into um, checking, right? But that's an easy example. I mean, many applications have differences. So we're just using simplicity for now. And then pay bill, basically we withdraw an amount from your checking account because we assume that is a checking account you're paying bill from. Right, Kevin, that's what you do. No? What did you say? I'm not hearing much from you, you know. That's not good. All right, so, um, moving on. Another exercise here, starting with the following objects. So we have a customer called Cost One, right? It was a saving account and a checking account with balances. Write the sequence of code to deposit $10,000 salary, transfer $5,000 and pay a bill for $3,000. Yes? Update the diagram to show the values at each step. How about that? So what do we need to do first? We need to deposit $10,000 salary, right? Into savings account. Then we transfer $5,000, right? Based on what we define transfer to be here. So we're taking from saving account, we're drawing from saving account and we deposit to checking account. And then we need to pay a bill, right? Everybody with me? Yeah? What should that look like? So after we deposit $10,000 salary, what should change? The balance where? In savings account, right? So that should change from $1,000 to $10,000 to $20,000. Then we're going to transfer 5000 from from our saving account to our checking account. So our checking account will become 15000 Then we pay a bill for 3000 So what should happen? Checking account should be reduced by 3000 So we will have 15000 Sorry, transfer 5,000, so we'll have 10,000 minus 3,000, 7,000 will be in our um, checking account, okay? So 20,000, so 15,000 in our savings account, right? After we take out the 5,000, um, and that is going to bring us to 10,000, and then we take out 3,000. So we'll have 15,000 in our savings account and 7,000 in our checking account. Happy? Yes? Happy? Good. All right, so. In general though, um, let us move to the overall concept of object-oriented programming. So, by the way, just to sum that part, you realize that now we are writing programs in a different kind of way, right? We're not writing step one, step two, step three. We're writing about some things that exist in a particular application, what data we store in them and what they can do. And we get our program working by asking them to do the things that they can do and sending messages, right? Hello. It's no longer that sequence of step one, step two, step three. So you realize now that if we model everything in a particular application as an object that can do something, then essentially, if we just make everything work together and do what they're supposed to do, then we're good, right? Kind of like an organization, right? Everybody know their job description. Right? They come to work and do their work. 
And if they need to do, get something done by somebody else, they call them and ask them to do it. Or send them an email, right? And they do it. And when they do it, then everybody keep doing what they're supposed to do. And all of a sudden, you get an organization that's functioning. But they're not lined up step by step by step. And so a lot of people tend to think or suggest that object-oriented programming is a little bit more natural. Because you can kind of model your application based on how the environment is set. Yes? In a school, we have a student, we have a lecturer, you know, we have um, other staff, and we can say, okay, what are students able to do? They can register for a course, they can delete a course, they can, you know, all those kind of things. Do an exam, whatever, whatever. Yes? Lecturer come and they can do a course, they can score an exam, and so on. When they put that together, they realize, oh, that is, those are all the things we need to do anyway. So what we do, we invoke the methods, and if we have an instance, when we have an instance of a student, that student can do those things, an instance of a lecturer, that lecturer can do those things, and so on and so forth. Yes? All right, so object-oriented program is mainly concerned with knowing how to identify objects that are needed to solve a problem, writing the code, for classes and then integrating and testing the code to make sure it works properly. All right. Um, generally, there are two activities that we will, we will do um, in order to um, get these things done. And one is object oriented analysis and object oriented design. Yes. Um, you will learn more about these when um, you start software engineering um, next year um, in general. We're going to focus a little bit um, today on the, the basic principles associated with object-oriented um, programming. And for this course, we're going to be just touching on those so that you understand you will do a little bit more application of the overall design in an enterprise-type system when they do software engineering. And there is another course about the object um, technology, uh, which also goes a little bit further in OOP. All right. so. Of course, there's some history, right? Um, this idea really started in the 1960s, um, of course, in Europe. And it was used in the lab first, and then it made mainstream because, of course, people thought that you know, this is a more natural way of doing things. And so people don't really think necessarily in sequence, right? People might think this more on, okay, who should do what, right? And, and who has responsibility for it, right? Um, and so you don't have to figure out the sequence in which it's going to happen, right? And put it in the right sequence. You can say, okay, you must do this, you must do that, you must do that. That's how we are organized anyway, yes? So, um, in 1970s, um, small talk um, was, was one um, used for the Dynabo. Can everybody know what the Dynabo is? It was really a sketch up of one of the first um, personal computers. Um, it looked it looked more like what, what a tablet would be today. But it was never commercially um, produced, right? It, was, it had a screen and a keyboard, right? And I think it was um, at Paul Alto, um, um, Xerox, I think, had something to do with it. But it was used to program that and um, small talk today is, is, is also widely used. Um, but in the early um, 80s, object-oriented programming um, actually um, was introduced um, to a language of C++, which was widely you know, accepted and used, and it became um, commercial um, close after. Now, Sun Microsystem actually um, introduced Java in 1995, and of course, you know, all programmers today would have heard about Java at some point in time um, because it's easily one of the most popular programming languages um, for object programming. People, not in a general, right? Uh, we hear about Java. Um, since then, of course, we've had many object oriented uh, languages, and there are some languages that allow you to program um, in either procedural or what we call functional. Um, or ways. Um, so, for example, Python, which was used in Comp 11, 26, and 27, um, we basically program procedurally, right? Um, so we write functions and functions, um, invoke other functions, and so on. 
um, what we can actually write object oriented um, in, in Python. Now, with Java, you must use object oriented uh, design principles. Right? Everything revolves around a class right? um, in Java. And so, we're going to be using Java um, for this course. Now, I want you to be clear. We're teaching object oriented programming and we're going to demonstrate the concepts using Java. We're not teaching Java. Okay? No, we would like for you to have a fair grasp of Java. And so what you will find is that some of the concepts we're going to be pushing you to explore them in the additional material. So when we talk about the concept in class, right, we are then going to say, okay, this is how we would do it in Java. But there are, are a number of other things that you might need to do to make it actually work. The lectures are going to be getting to the point. The labs and the tutorials, you'll get an opportunity to explore using the different constructs, the different things that are necessary in order to get the actual anecdotal evidence that we show in lecture to work. So I want you to get it that you will come to class, we will show you some code, but the exact code that we show you can't necessarily be copied and work. What we will do is post the full example online. So when we zoom in and we'll show you how to create a class and so on. There are no more other things you might have to do in order to make your, your program actually work. All right? You need to import some stuff. Um, you, know, you need to make sure your environment is, is tuned a particular way and so on and so on. We're not going to focus much on that inside of the lectures. All right? Now, OOP is not a language. It's a programming paradigm. It's a way of doing things. Right? So Java, it turns out, is a good way of, is a good tool to use because the Java way ensures that it must be done using object-oriented um, programming if you're going to implement anything in Java. All right? Um, so any programming languages that support OOP must provide support for something called abstraction, which we're going to talk about, encapsulation, information hiding, inheritance, and polymorphism. We're going to be taking inheritance and polymorphism as separate lectures, right? It takes that much amount of time for us to get through it correctly. So those are lectures further on. And if you look on the schedule of lectures, which is posted on our video, you will see that. Right? These are the defining principles of OOP in general. So let's look at abstraction briefly. So as you would have seen earlier, when we started talking about um, objects, um, we started to talk about an object, for example, as in a house or a custom, all right? Now, all of a sudden, when I say custom or a house, you know that there are many things that might be associated with a house or a custom, but I didn't get into all the detail, yes? Because, in a sense, within the environment, you know what a house or a house custom is, right? Now, adding to that thing, Right? Abstraction really is about removing the details that is not particularly important um, to a person. So, OOP provides abstraction by um, allowing you to represent things, for example, that exist in the real world. Okay? Hiding certain details and only showing the essential features of the object. Right? And we're going to talk extensively about that. All right, so we're going to talk about this, especially in the discussion of encapsulation, right? Um, now, if you think about it, an account object is a simplified representation of what a bank account is supposed to be. So, in all of the encapsulation, we're going to the fact that an object binds together the data and its functions, right, that manipulate the data. What that really means is that if it's done properly, you cannot access the data from outside of the class. So you notice when we wanted to withdraw or deposit, we had to define what is called a method that allows you to deposit or allows you to withdraw. So in a sense, you could not 
just modify the variable called balance without using the method that is defined to modify it. And we had two such methods, right? The withdraw and the deposit. You with me? Even when you wanted to find out how much money was in the balance, we had to do check balance. Yes? And so we, that is a way we prevent anything outside of the object from manipulating the data that we say are encapsulated or hidden within the object. Yes? Now, the account object stores all data that is pertinent to an account and provides operations to manipulate. The other thing is, too, if there is no method provided by the object to manipulate some, something that is encapsulated in it, it can't be done. It is prevented. So you will realize, of course, as you program, right, if you attempt to do that, Java is going to give you an error. All right? So you cannot access private member or something like that. Yes. Uh, so this is just adding to um, the, the idea of, of, of encapsulation um, and, and, and the, the note there is, is instructive, right? A properly defined object does not expose its private parts, <laughs> right? And you should remember that. <laughs> yes? There are some things in times, eh? Now, it's a play upon the words because you actually use the word private for those things that you don't want to expose. <laughs> right? It is the actual word that you use. So if you don't want to expose it, you make it private. Right? If you want to expose it, you make it public. <laughs> yes? <laughs> right. Now, Basically, the interface to an object should be totally defined by its operation or the operations it supports. So if you don't want something to be modifiable, then don't write a method that allows you to modify it or don't make it accessible. You follow what I'm saying? Now, for example, if you don't want somebody to be able to um, set balance to zero, right, without having to do a constant withdrawal, then don't write a method that allows that. And then you make balance private. So only the things that you define as methods are usable on that, right? Now, this principle is essential to ensure that different implementation of the same object can be, substitute, can be substituted one for the other. Now, what does that really, really mean? Now, think about it. If we create an account class, for example, and we create some methods for that account class, and we have some data items, right? We're in the real world, so things change. Now, all of a sudden, there's a new regulation for us to maintain something additional about an account. Yes? The rest of the application that uses the account class don't need to know what you change inside the account class. They only need to know whether or not they can modify or update or get that information. Yes? So what ends up happening? Listen, watch this now. So I have an account class which only had balance. All of a sudden, I say, boy, every account must carry an ID number. Okay? Now, we are supposed to be able to go in that account class, make the modification to include the ID number, but not having to go and change anything all over the place. Because that that modification was private anyway, so nobody no need to know. The impact of that really is also that when you change the internal structure of your class, right, shouldn't mean that you have to go and change and tell everybody that you change. Because the only thing they know are the things that should be public to them anyway. So in the case of the account class, the deposit should work just the same, the withdrawal should work just the same. If you follow what I'm saying? Because you didn't allow for an external entity to see inside. So that if you change inside, then you have to now show them again. You, you hide it. Right? It's like when you go to an office, right? Think about it, right, Deandra? You go to an office. And you said, you said to the, the, the secretary, the, she said, I can ask the city boss. And you said to the secretary, I would like to get approval for this item. 
right? And you just give them a document and you see it come back with approval. You don't know how the approval was done and you're in a business. You don't even know if it's the boss approved it. I could have somebody in the boss and it to approve, right? But whatever happens in the background, right, is private. You just know that whatever you ask for, it comes back. So think about it. If the boss is not there one day, right, and somebody else approved it, you're not going to know. Yes, if the process behind it change, right? And you're going to, you're not going to know. Yes, that is the idea. Okay? And that becomes a very, very important principle in object oriented programming. All right? So, an object can also be easily reused in another program once it adheres to this principle. Because all, they, don't, they don't expose the details. Right? Go on, eh? Expose the things that are supposed to be public. All right. Inheritance is a mechanism where a new class can be derived from an existing class. And we're going to talk about this at length. Right? It comes from the perspective that, you know, um, you have a parent and then you can have children and those children can have other children. But just like in, in, in the human, um, um, the way humans um, are built, you are going to, as a child, you are going to have some characteristic of your parent, such that you can tell that the parent is really your, your parent, right? Yeah? And we do that through what we call DNA, right? DNA analysis, right? You can say, okay, yeah, man, you carry the same markers that your parent has, right? So in the same way here, um, child class that inherits from the parent carries the markers of the peer, right? And so it's one way of easily reusing something that you're built already. So, for example, if you are building an application um, such as a code, right? You could actually, sorry, that uses uh, objects such as a code. You could differentiate one account from the other. You could have a parent class called account, and you have a child class called savings, and another child called checking. The reason why those two would be separate, it could be that a checking account maintains different data and have different methods, right? A savings account have different data and different methods, but both of them will inherit everything from the account class. So it's a way of differentiating. So the only things that are different between them are going to be put in their class because they automatically inherit everything from the parent. But we're going to talk a lot more about that, so no worries. Now, polymorphism refers to the ability of an object to take on different forms, right? This one is a little tricky. So it's not easily explained, but let's look at the example. A loan account and an investment account are both objects of the same type, right? They are based on the class account, right? But each calculates interest in a different way. Think about that. So maybe uh, in Jamaica you don't get um, you don't get interest on, on, on a checking account. Only charges you get on checking account, right? <laughs> you get you might get interest uh, on a savings account if you're rich. That's how it is in Barbados, Kevin. I don't think so. No. Or you don't have that, or, or you don't keep your money in the bank. <laughs> anyway, so inheritance could be used to define these two types of account, just as I gave you a while ago, where one is a child class or what we call a subclass. Right? Um, a collection of accounts could have both types of accounts. So we have a group of accounts. Right? So let's say we have all the accounts at, at a particular bank, say First Caribbean, right? Polymorphism allows you to simply ask each one to calculate interest, how it is done, depending on which type of account is asked to calculate interest. So in a sense, we could call calculate interest on each account, not knowing their type, whether it's checking or savings. And they will know which version of calculated interest to use based on their type. 
So the checking account will know that they must use the calculated interest, which is in its type, right? But remember, it's one statement that we are going to be using. But automatically, depending on the type, it runs the version that is appropriate, right? So it takes on different forms. But we're going to spend, as I said, an entire lecture talking about polymorphism, right? Just know that, you know, it's like, oh, the same person can be here different when they are party and when they are class, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Depending on the type of occasion it is, yes? They know how to adapt, adapt right? Right, Bajans? Yeah. Good. All right. So we stop in there um, for the first hour. Oh, I'm good with time. All right. All right. Um, one A, we talk some about classes and objects, instantiation. We talk a little bit about methods. We talk a little bit about the history and um, some principles. We're going to start using learning how to write in Java. Um, because that's what we're going to be predominantly using. So what we thought is that we're going to give you a, a short introduction to, um, to Java programming and some, some basic concepts to get you running, right? So you can actually, um, you know, apply it, uh, about it, all right? You will also know that the lab this week um, will have some videos, right? They are posted already. It's um, an activity you do on your own. But they have some videos that are going to, um, you know, guide you in setting up the environment which we're going to use, which is Eclipse, right? And also getting your, your fingers moving right now with our job, all right? Um, so the lab this week is self-directed activity. You do it on your own. You can go to the lab as, as you see fit, but it's not really going to be a prompted um, lab. Right, profited labs, which we will grade, um, actually start next week. All right, all right. So we're gonna take five minutes, okay, Bill? Okay. Okay. I'm just gonna pause, um, and then we will um, start back exactly okay. ten minutes after two. All right. Are you okay? Yeah. yeah. All right, so this is the second part of our um, first lecture, um, which we're going to talk a little bit about Java um, so that we'll provide you with the necessary tools to uh, be able to work through the course. All right, so we're going to talk about the basic Java syntax, which is much different from what you might have been exposed to before. Um, especially from COP 11, 26, 27, which focused on Python. Um, then we're going to look at writing a simple class in Java. So I gave you the pictorial representation and a conceptual um, background to um, a class. So we're going to actually see how we do that in Java. And then I'm going to show you a little bit uh, of what is required to actually get it to work in a real program. All right? So, First thing, um, Java is very popular. Um, it, it's an OOP language that is as good as any other, um, but it does make Java the only or best first. We had that question in, in previous course, which language is the best? There is no best language. It really depends on what you're trying to do. Now, the thing is that Java forces you to write object-oriented um, programs. And so, um, once you learn Java well, you will have a fairly good appreciation for um, programming because Java is going to force you. If it's not written properly, you know, in OOP terms, Java will complain. All right? Like, for example, um, C++, um, which allows you to actually mix and mingle um, object and procedure because of the fact that C++ and C compilers actually work um, together. All right. Now, Java is strict. Um, Java is platform independent. 
which means that if you run um, Mac, if you run Linux, you know, whichever, you just download the, the Java um, virtual machine for that, right? Once you have a virtual machine, right, um, the JVM, then you can run uh, Java code. Now, in order to program or to write programs and test it, you'll have to um, download the Java development kit, right? Which is completely different from the actual in integrated development environment, such as Eclipse, that you will use. So they are separate. Now, I think the version that we will publish online is going to include um, the links that will allow you to get the JDK and to make sure it's configured with Eclipse so that they work together seamlessly. Um, it seems that it's secure, and I don't mean I won't spend too much time on that. Um, it's architecture neutral, and so what ends up happening is that the, the code that you write gets interpreted um, into what is called bytecode, which is executable on many systems. Now, the bytecode is actually executed by the JVM, which is the Java runtime environment, right? Um, Java virtual machine, sorry. Yeah. All right, it's portable. As a matter of fact, um, well, that's not possibility, but if you think about it, I mean, up until recently, there, there probably was hardly any mobile device that didn't use Java um, for something. All right, um, it's scalable. Right, it's architecture neutral. Right, um, and it was written in C. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's robust, right? Um, it, it, it does uh, compile time error checking and runtime error checking. And I'm sure every Java programmer will always see that um, stack trace when the program um, encounters an error. It tells you where, which line, everything, right? Um, once you run and there's, a, there's an error. So it's easy for you to go back and check exactly what caused the error. All right? And that is something that actually, if I'm not mistaken, what are you doing the command line, which, for example, you might be using Notepad to write your Java code, and you try to, to, um, to compile the code, you will get the errors there. Um, with other um, languages, the compiler will give you that much you have to have an integrated development environment to actually catch the error and, and pass it back to you. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, Java is multi threaded uh, which means that it's possible to write programs that can perform many tasks simultaneously. All right? And multi threading is an advanced topic, um, but in a sense, you can have multiple parts of the application executing at the same time, right? So for example, when we do events, um, and um, we click up a mouse, we generate some event, which is caught by an aspect of the program and some other activities triggered and so on and so on, right? You can run multiple of those things in what we call threads, right? Um, and Java is interpreted. So the code is translated on the fly, to a native bytecode, um, and it's not stored anywhere. Right? The development process is more rapid and analytical, since the linking is an incremental and lightweight process. So, um, Java enables high performance also with what we call just in time um, compilers. Of course, um, the compiler that we use actually um, can be, there are multiple versions of. Right, I think the one we're going to be using is from Oracle, um, which actually bought some microsystems systems recently. Right. All right, so basic syntax. That was the history, right? Uh, that, that, that will help you maybe with one or two more choice questions, but that's it, right? <laughs> that's that's 0 0.5 credit miles <laughs> out of one. Right, right Barbados? Yep, yes, sir. Good. All right, so writing Java programs, very, very useful. All right, so um, we have a small program here which allows you to print uh, Hello World to the screen. Now notice, we have had 
to do quite a bit of things before we get there. Right? Contrary to what you would have been used to in Python, if you wanted to do that, you just type a line and it's done, right? In Java, how many lines it takes, right? Several more. And some things look rather strange, doesn't it? Because if you think about it, you have to create a class, then you have to create inside that class a method in order for it to actually do something. All right, so let's break it down. So first we have the access modifiers. The access modifier is telling me, okay, how should I treat this part of the class? Should I make everybody know that it is there or is it my own private business? Yes? And notice, what is the access modifier here? It's public, right? The word class is a keyword that you have to use when you're creating a class. So every class, you must use the word C-L-A-S, right? Easy spelling. Then, we have the name of the class that comes afterwards. Now, notice something. And although this is not incorrect in the main, you lose marks for it. Your class names should be written in proper case, which means every word should begin with a capital letter. And we generally don't put space, um, you can't have spaces, but we generally don't use underscores and so on. It's one word. Now, notice this class is called My First Java Program. And each of the words are in capital. Okay? So, My First Java and Program, right? And they are joined. It's not wrong to do it the other way around, but you're going to lose marks because it's against convention. You will always realize that every class, and I'll show you some classes that are built in, in the API documentation, will start with a capital letter. Every class, please, right? The next part is something that we're going to skip over a little bit. That public static void main, string args, just know that for now, um, if you're writing a Java program, it is what goes between the curly brackets after here, here, and down to here. It is that that the compiler is going to execute. Okay? Let that sink in a little bit. Only what is between those two curly brackets will be executed. So when the Java um, interpreter, the, 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 the virtual machine is invoking the program that you have written to actually run it now to make somebody can use it. What it's going to go to is whatever code is written between this curly bracket here and this one. So therefore means if you're writing a full Java program, you must have a class which has in it public static void main, right? And all the things that you want your program to be able to do must be written in there, yes? Now, for our program, all we're doing is printing out a simple string, right? And how you do that is by system out that print L or print line, and you put the string in quotations. You're seeing my mouse, right, Barbados? Yes, sir, yes. Good, all right. Now, this public static void main string args, you just write it back as gospel now, okay? No, notice I did not say that we were creating a class here, okay? But we are. We've just created a class which doesn't have any data members in it. All it has is one method, and that method is called main. It returns nothing, it's void. It's what we call a static method, right? And then we have the code inside here. When you write a Java application, you will always have to have a class that has a main in it. Something looking like this. Okay? Now, that's what we're talking about in terms of the other things that might be required to get what you're doing to work. Because you couldn't just write this line here so. Right? And it worked. You follow me? Yes? Now, all right, so that's a basic syntax of a Java program. Now, every method that you write will have an access modifier. Every class that you write will have an access modifier. Now, you would think, for example, that 
a class because a class is going to be instantiating many objects, right? And a class object is going to be used in other places. If we make it private, we're going to have a problem, don't we? Because it means if it's private, then nothing else in the program can see. So you assume that a class is automatically public, but that's not true. Yes, because there is a concept of an inner class, which is a class within a class, is one way we will end up writing private classes. And we'll do that later on when we do some um, graphical user interface program. Anyway, any questions? All right, so we're happy with the different pieces now. Remember I was saying to you, we're just printing out a, a word, a two words here, right? And we use, we have to create a class to do that, and we have to use the main method in order to get it to work. But what if we were to create the account class or the customer class and so on? Those classes will not carry a main method inside of them, generally. Because those classes are going to be used for things and referenced elsewhere. So you just build it as it is, and then when you're ready for your program to come together, you put the logic inside a main method, inside a separate class. That class, like this here, my first Java program, is what we usually call a Java class, or a test class. Or we use it just to make sure things are working together. All right? Predominantly, our conversation will be driver class. We will refer to um, a class that kind of brings everything together and make your program work as a driver class, all right? Now, in the driver class, all you generally will be doing is writing the logic that instantiate objects, for example, and do things like deposit and withdraw and so on. So those statements that we've been writing about draw 500 and deposit five and so on, those activities generally come inside your driver class that bring things together to make your application function. All right? I want you to get that. Now, in Java, unlike in Python, you have to declare your variables and you have to declare them to be of a particular type. Remember, in Python, it is the point at which you assign a value to the variable that the type is determined. In Java, you have to tell the type before. All right? Now, Defining, declaring variables are done by assigning an identifier to it. Now, an identifier is just a name that you use to refer to it. But they, there are some restrictions. All names that are used in Java are case sensitive. So you see the example here, total, written with a capital T is different from total with a capital a command. And this one here. If one letter is a different case, it's a different word. Save yourself some nightmares. Remember what we said though. If you see total, KB, right? If you see this total written somewhere in your Java code, what would you assume? Talking too loud, I can't hear you. What would you assume, class? Is a reference to a variable? This one, you would assume that it's the name of a class. Why? Because it starts with an uppercase letter. I remember I said by convention, names of classes start with uppercase letters. What that therefore means that if you have a variable that is not a class, you want to make it lowercase, if you have a type, right? All right, anyway, by convention, title cases for class names, as it says just below that, right? See it here, title cases for class names, upper cases for constant, and variable names start with a lowercase letter. You cannot start an identifier with a number. It has to start with a letter. These are some words that you will come across. None of these words can be used as identifiers for your variable or your constants, right, or your class names, okay? If you use them, 
Java understand them to mean something specific. All right? And it will do the action associated with it. So these words are reserved. Okay? Um, access modifiers, I started to tell you a little bit about that earlier. Um, and I said that um, things that are stated as being public can um, be accessed by any other variable or method that is declared um, with it or within the application. Private only methods and objects in the same class can access, right? Because it's hidden, yes? Um, typically, variables are declared as private. So you create a class and you, you have a string and you have an integer, you have a float and those kind of things. Um, say balance is a, is, a, is a float, for example, because the you know, balance can be 10.5 and so on. Um, you make those private, okay? Now, in general, um, if you make it public, there must be a justifiable reason why it is so. So you have to explain. And now these are the little things that we have to, we will look for in your labs, right? Make sure you adhere to certain principles, okay? There's another access modifier called protective, but we will talk about that much later. We'll take a lecture for me to introduce that. All right, so quick recap, because I don't want to lose anybody. Right? Remember what we said? These are the basic parts of the program, right? We have the access modifier. We have the reserved word, right? Then we have the name of the class. True? Yes? Good. And then we start a method. We have the access modifier. I tell you, just write back this. But in general, you start a, a method with public and a name, right? And what it returns. But don't worry about that yet. But the method code begins after you write the curly bracket and ends where the curly bracket ends. Notice the class also starts with a curly bracket and ends with a curly bracket. Right? We use a semicolon to mark the end of a statement. All right? Good. Just so everybody is on board. Now, a variable provides a name storage for a Java component. Now, in order to create a variable, you write the data type that you want, and then you give it a name. Remember we said a name is the identifier. We could also create multiple variables in the same line and separate them by commas. So gallons MPG are, are of type double, okay? Miles is of type int, all right? Now, we could have put the second line and the first line with the semicolon being right there, it would see it as two separate statements. It's not a problem. Once you have a semicolon, it sees it as a separate statement. What we could not do is put a comma here and then put double gallons, MPG, and so on. Right? That would be an error. Um, so I told you already, every program that every variable that is used must be declared prior to use. Now, we can also declare and initialize at the same time, which is to say, this is a type, this is a name, and set it to this which is what is being done here, yes? So we create an integer called sum and we set it to zero, all right? So when a variable is referenced in a program, its current value is used. So if I say print sum, sum would print zero because I had set it to zero, all right? Now, these are some things that you will sit down and study. Um, which talks about the minimum and maximum value that can be stored in the various types. We have byte, short, int, long, float, and double. And this is what we, these are what we call primitive data types in Java. Primitive data types. They come with the language, right? So these are the starting points. So almost every application that you write, you're going to be using some variations of these, possibly joined together in some way to create a class. You follow? So, I mean, I haven't spoken about character and stringers yet, all right? Because those are really, um, different. Now, character is a single value that is enclosed in a quotation, right? And that is also a primitive data type. There is a significant difference between a character and a string. A string is an object. A character is a primitive data type. Okay? Just like short and int and long and float and double. Right? 
So if you're using string, there are some things that will be different. So whereas you can say int x equal five in any Java program anywhere and it works, in order to use string, you're going to have to first import, right? Um, and then be able to apply it based on how we, 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 we use any other class, all right? And I'll show you where the, those information can be found, all right? Now, constant generally is a identifier associated with some value that does not change throughout the course of, course of the program, all right? So what that essentially means is that if I set something, create something to be a constant, it means that um, it, its value cannot be modified. And in Java, we use the final um, keyword to declare a constant. And notice something here. We give the constant a name that is in all caps. That is by convention again. So that if you're looking through a Java program and you see a variable, not a variable, you see an identifier in all caps, you should be able to reasonably assume that it's a constant. Yes? And constants are, are very useful. Let's say we want to be able to um, have a fixed amount to calculate GCT on all prices. You might want to set the GCT to be a constant because that doesn't change. Right? Or in Barbados, it might be called VAT, VAT value added tax, right? Um, that doesn't really change. It's a fixed amount throughout your application. But another benefit of it is that just in case that value needs to change, right? You can change it one place, and because it's a constant, every place that it is used, it automatically assumes a new value. You don't have to go through the entire code to go and modify, modify, modify. So when you, when you use a statement like this, Everywhere you want the value to be associated, you just use the name associated with the constant and it assumes the value, all right? Easy thing. Um, some other things, extra lines and white spaces are ignored by Java. Um, however, you want to format your program to, um, to make it readable. Um, so I have some examples here which you should not pay much attention to because they are very bad ways of writing your code. Notice we have a lot of spaces and the semicolon in another line here and space there and so on. It looks so nice, right? Although the compiler will ignore the extra spaces and so on. It, it, we don't program like this. We're university students. Although this code will be interpreted by the Java compiler, sorry, will be compiled and it will be fine. We don't write code like this, right? Indentation is not so important in Java as it is in Python. But it's terrible programming style. And terrible with a capital T. All right? Okay. So, also we expect you to write your code with um, notations, notes in it that humans can understand. All right? And these are called comments. Um, these comments are, can be written in three ways. The first one is using the double slash here, right? The second is using the slash and star, and the third one is using two stars after the slash. Now, this, the final one here, um, we will talk a little bit more about it later, but if you write your comments this way, then there is something called Java doc which generates HTML version of your, those comments and produces it um, as documentation for your code. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it later on. All right? Um, quick check. Which of the following are valid Java valid identifiers? And cable, the first four are yours. So is the first one valid? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Good. The second one? Yes. The third one? No. 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 Okay. The fourth one? Yes. 
The fifth one. No. No. All right. All right. Local students. The sixth one. Yes or no? They said yes. The sixth one, the seventh one. The sixth one. Yeah, the seventh one. They said no. The eighth one. They said no. And the ninth one. They said no. All right. Not doing so bad. Huh? All right. Now, if you say min maximum, as you see it here, it is reasonable to assume that it's a constant, right? If you see network connection, it's reasonable to assume that it's a class, right? Yes, or an object, right? Good. And quiz grade, it's, it's kind of not what we would usually use, right? right? But grade is, is, is a primitive type, yes? Anyway, more and more on that later. All right, so any questions on basic Java syntax and data types? Everybody happy? Good. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about writing a simple class. All right. The ones like we were talking about, like the account or the customer. Well, the customer is a simple, but, you know, like the account, right? So we're going to look at how we write that in Java, for example. All right. Um, and, and, and talk a little bit about it. So, as I said earlier, all Java code is written in classes, and class contains variables that store data. Uh, it also contains methods, and methods perform actions on the information that is stored in an object. Yes? Happy, right? So, the name of the class, the data, and the, the methods can be depicted using a UML diagram, as you see on your screen. Okay? Now we need to write the code for it. Wow. And you see it moving across the screen, right? Makes me happy. Good. So now, the UML code for the class is very similar to the structure. Yes? Look at it. The name, followed by the data it stores, followed by the methods, right? Look again. So we have the word public and class. So public is the access modifier, right? And class is a reserved word. And then we have the name of the class, right? And all of that is considered to be the class header. Then we usually write the variables, right? Or the, the data members for our class here. Then we write the methods. Of course, notice the curly bracket is the start of the class and we have to have a curly bracket to end the class. Yes? No, remember an object is created from a class. Each instance will keep its own data. We talked about that already. This means that an object that is instantiated from a class will have its own copy of each of the variables in the class. And that now, we will talk a little bit more about that because you can have some variables that only one copy is maintained for all instances. All right? We'll pass further on in the news. All right? I, I just said that. Good. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so here is our class now for the account. You notice one line is different, right? We have an access modifier followed by a data type followed by an identifier, right? So we have now essentially declared the balance, which is of type double, and it's a private member of the account class. Everybody see that? You know everything in this side, right? I, I show you these things coming already, right? Now, we're building the same class we drew in the diagram. Now, in addition to declarations of variables in the code, we 
must now declare the methods. Okay? What are the methods for the account class? Withdraw, deposit, and check balance, right? Good. Now, it turns out that in general, when you're creating a class, there are three types of methods. Types, I said enough, of methods or classifications. There's a special method called a constructor. It looks different, all right? It is really used to initialize what we call the instance data when the object is created. So, the constructor would allow us to set up the initial value of balance. Suppose to say when you create an account by default, your balance is set to zero, right? We would have to create, right, a method called a constructor that allows you to do that setup before you can do any withdrawing or anything, just to make sure you say you have an instance, right, of the account class. Then we have methods that can be classified as either accessors, or mutators. Easy. Is that it? Getting some value and giving it back to me. Or it's modifying some value within it. Okay? Just a classification. All right? And you can determine what type of method it is by classification. All right? Now, let us look at the constructor. The constructor generally must have the same name of the class but it does not have a return type. You realize that? It has the access modifier of public. It has the name of the class and then it opens bracket and then you have the list of parameters and then the code for it goes in where you have the right here. Yes, inside here. The curly braces come back again, start and end, right? Kevin, okay, are you still with me? Yes. Okay, it's telling me my internet connection is unstable. So here's a constructor for the, um, the class now written. Notice the class is called account. I, I start it here, it ends here. Then I create the instance variable called balance, which is of type double, and it's a private member. But then I have the constructor, which is public, the same name of the class, right? And it takes in a double, which is called start balance. And what it does, it takes whatever is passed into it as start balance and puts it in balance. So you realize I have now set up this instance with whatever is passed in as the starting balance. Yes? And that's the purpose of this construct. As a matter of fact, when you're actually creating an instance, after the name, if I say P equal new account, right? What we are essentially doing is calling the constructor to set up P as an instance of account. And you'll see some examples of that. You can't visualize it. So a constructor is a special method. Um, and I told you this already, all right? It does not need to return anything. Right? Um, other methods um, can return a value, and if it doesn't return a value, it can be void. And so um, the get balance method is an ex example of an accessor method. Um, so that when the method is called, it must return um, the, the account balance. And what that really means is that get balance is supposed to give you back what the balance is, which is what we mean by return, of course. Um, no, because get balance will return something, we have to tell Java what type it will return. So notice here, if we have get balance, get balance returns a balance. What is the type of balance? We created balance up here. It's of type double. And therefore, double has to come before the name as the return type for the get balance method. Easy, right? Like taking candy from a sleeping baby. How about the deposit method? What do you think it is? An access a constructor or a mutator? A mutator. Good. Because what it does, it modifies some instance data. 
So you take whatever is in balance and add the amount that you pass in here and put it back in balance. So it basically modifies something. So it's a move. Right? And of course, the visibility, the access modif uh, modifier is public. Um, the return type is void because this method doesn't return anything. The name is deposit and it takes in as a parameter an amount which is of type double. That's about it. How about the withdraw? Is it an access a modifier or access a mutator uh, or a mutator because it also modifies the instance variable called balance. Okay? See that bit? Barbados? Having a good time? Very much. Pretty much? Good. All right. So now we have written the class called account with a constructor, right? And then we've written the class. We've written inside there a method to get balance, withdraw, and deposit. How do we test this now to make sure it's working? Because the class, something which I didn't tell you, but it might just um, happen automatically with the tool that you're going to be using, becomes a file on its own. And the name of the class must be the same name as the file. So if you create a class called account, then the file name must be account also, right? And it will be account.jab, right? Depending on the tool you're using, and certainly Eclipse will do this automatically for you. But if you were to use Notepad to write your Java and so on, then you'd have to make sure that when you're saving the file, you save it as that, right? Now, um, in testing a class, generally, what we do is to write um, code um, in a, what is called a driver class to do that. So a class is written to be used with other classes, right? However, it's best that we test the class we write before using it with other classes, and this is generally what we call unit testing. Um, we're going to be writing a program that can use, be used to test your own class. All right? Just like we did earlier, we're going to be writing this in a class that has the name. All right? And I told you why. So here we are. We already wrote a class called account. And now we are going to test it. Notice the class is called account test. And this is an example of what we call a driver class. Everybody with me? Notice it has the public static void main string R is like, and this method has a start and an end and then the code that we want to run. Okay? Notice the first thing I say is using account, which is the type, we are creating a variable called my account. And I have equal new account 100. So this new account really is calling the constructor for the account class to set up a new instance called my account. And my account will have in 100 because this 100 that is being passed in here becomes what was expected when we create this constructor, right? Here, the start balance. So the value we pass in becomes this, start balance. So then that 100 is in start balance, it gets put into balance, yes? And so our constructor has just instantiated um, the object, right? Um, my account with 100. So if I, go my account that deposit i am calling the deposit on the instance called my account the object with 20. what is the result of that Sorry, my balance will become 120. then i call my account that withdraw 50. what should be the result of that my balance gets modified to 70. 
So when I go system.out.println, my account.get balance, get balance gives me what the variable called balance that is associated with the instance my account and print line basically prints out whatever is inside here. So this is going to be printing out the balance that was returned by get balance for the instance my account. Everybody sees that? Now get balance, all get balance does is return the value of balance. So it's returning the value of balance in relation to the my account instance, right? Which is going to be 70 and then this statement prints whatever is going to be like. Yes? Not right? Kind of easy, right? All right. There will be some notable things um, posted here. Um, I want you to pay attention to um, the, the examples. My suggestion is that you're going to, you, you go online, get yourself in the environment quickly, um, take the code that we've had here, type it up for yourself, and, and play around with it a little bit. Um, also, don't expect us to um, give you every single piece of code that you will ever need to run. You're going to have to write and learn on your own. There's one thing I really wanted to do, which I haven't done today. Um, I wanted to show you um, how to get to um, the, um, the Java API documentation. Um, but I will, I will post um, something in relation to that online, right? But Java comes with a lot of reusable code, and um, much of that is accessible through a structured set of documentation called the API, which tells you what classes are available that can be used for what, right? And how do you use the methods associated with it, all right? And it's, it's, it has to come um, natural to you that when you are about to write a program in Java, the next thing you do is pull up the API documentation to find out what exists, what you can use, and how it is used. That's really it. Every Java's, Java programmer's best friend is the API documentation. Okay, so we have two minutes for our questions. Barbados, you're far, so you get to go first. Are these slides already online? Yes, they are online. Are you able to access or really? Um, we endeavor to put the slides online before the class, so at least you have um, access to it. I think these slides went up last night. Um, we are going to be putting them up a little bit earlier um, each week. So. Hopefully by, say, the Saturday before the Monday, the slides should be up, the latest, so that you can pull them down and um, be aware of, of what is to come. Okay. First, you said the program is eclipsed, right? I didn't hear that. Say that again? You said the program is eclipsed, right? We will be using eclipse. Eclipse, eclipse, yes. The videos that are posted online um, will guide you in downloading and setting it up. Did you confirm that you have access to this course page? Uh, you're checking, hold on. Okay. I can see the program, but I can't see the content as well. So that's something you have to look at. Hello. 